So moving on to our next speaker, our, our um, plenary speaker, first plenary speaker of the day. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Mark Mapstone. Um, he was last up here a few years ago uh, for um, uh, another conference, which a number of you may have attended. Uh, he is a professor of neurology at the University of California. He is a member of the Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders and a fellow for neurobiology of learning and memory. His research focuses on preclinical detection of neurological disease using cognitive tests and biomarkers obtained from the blood. His special interest is in developing strategies to maintain successful cognitive aging. His research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health in the States, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Defense. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Mapstone. I'm going to try and use this mic. How does this sound, people in the back? Good? I see thumbs up back there. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll just use this. I'll try and keep my... Uh, head near the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Jean, for, for the lovely introduction and for inviting me up here again to Vancouver. I'm, I'm very pleased and, and actually privileged to be here um, to speak to you today. Um, I'd like to thank also Stacy Dawes, who um, helped me with uh, my travel and arrangements and all of that. And so thank you to the uh, uh, Parkinson Society of BC. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to uh, be speaking today about non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And um, I'm, I'm sad to hear of the, the scarcity of available options such as DBS here in, in BC for sufferers of Parkinson's disease. But um, I also want to be able to, to tell you about um, uh, cognitive symptoms of Parkinson's disease because I think that they're um, under-recognized. And as we hopefully through this uh, lecture uh, I go through, I hope that I can tell you, oh, these are not mine. <laughs> it's a very nice picture of Doug. Uh, here we go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, let, me, let me start off with some disclosures. Uh, I, I don't believe I have any conflicts of interest here, but I'll let you dis decide that. But just to be forthcoming, these are the things that I, I use to fund my research. These are the mechanisms here. Um, and I'm going to use this pointer. I hope that it helps. But uh, granting uh, grants, um, I receive honorary travel and things like this to speak at conferences like this. So they pay for my travel. Um, I'm a consultant for a a uh, biotech company that's doing gene therapy in Parkinson's disease, but I'm not going to be talking about that today, so I don't think there's a conflict there. And then finally, I have patents related to my research, um, and again, I'm not going to be speaking about any of that. So I don't think that there are conflicts of interest, but that's up to you to decide. So let's start off with, with some background. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist. I focus on the cognitive aspects of movement disorders and memory disorders of, of older adults. How many here in this room have seen a neuropsychologist? Ah, okay, just as I suspected, so uh, maybe two or three. So we are part of a DBS, or sorry, a Parkinson's disease care team that I think is really important. And, um, and, and again, there might be a, a lack of access issue here in BC that precludes maybe involving neuropsychologists in, in your care. But it's something that I think really should be considered because as I'm going to try and uh, convince you, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, particularly the cognitive symptoms, are really very important and very impactful. Um, let me start off with a little bit of background. This is traditionally how we do things when I teach the medical students. You start off with a, talking about the prevalence of the disease. And Parkinson's disease, as you probably know, is the second most prevalent neurodegenerative disease in the world behind Alzheimer's disease. The estimated prevalence in Canada is about 100,000 cases. And in the United States, it's almost an order of magnitude higher, nearly a million cases. And then there's about 10 million cases worldwide. You can see that Canada has a, has a large age-adjusted prevalence. Uh, you really probably can't see the scale here, but um, the red is the highest prevalence adjusted for age. And you can see that Canada leads the world as far as the age-adjusted prevalence of Parkinson's disease. The incidence, meaning new cases every year, is about 6,000 new cases in Canada, 
about 60,000 in the U.S., and about 600,000 across the world. So this is a very prevalent disease with more and more cases coming online. And that's mostly because of the aging of our societies. Since we have good medicines and good health care, uh, people are living longer. And because Parkinson's is, is largely an age-related disease, the longer you live, the more likely you are to get the disease. So this is a very significant problem. And the impact of the problem is not just in, to the patient. So this disease affects people who, who contract the disease, but it also affects their care partners, it affects their families, and it affects their communities as well, and society overall. More than half of the people with Parkinson's disease over the course of their disease will rely on somebody else for help, and that's probably pretty intuitive. Um, but most of the people providing help are family and friends. So this is something that affects not just the person with Parkinson's disease, but also their family as well. It affects people typically in their productive years. So this is a meaningful impact where people are unable to do the things that they want to do, including work, uh, social activities and hobbies, um, prevents you probably from mountain climbing and, and other such things like this. And of course, the economic burden of Parkinson's disease is very high. Uh, the average cost of the healthcare system uh, here is about $25,000 per year per patient, which is about $2.5 billion in direct costs in Canada. And that doesn't include non-medical costs. So that's time off of work for caregivers. That doesn't mean lost wages. So this is the direct medical care. So this is really a very big problem. So let's go back historically. Um, the, 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 the disease or the disorder, the clinical syndromes were first described in an essay by James Parkinson in 1817 in a little manuscript that, titled um, An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Subsequently, this uh, set of clinical symptoms was called Parkinson's disease after James Parkinson, who described it in 1817. And he was an English um, physician. They really didn't subspecialize back then, so he was a doctor in, in England. And he noticed uh, folks around uh, the streets of London. And he decided to do a study of, of people that he saw walking around London who had this unusual uh, motor problem. And so he described six cases um, on the, the, the shaking palsy. And in this little manuscript, um, if you read it, he focuses very deeply on the motor symptoms. And we're all aware of this. This is the, the four symptoms that I have up here. Uh, tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, which means a slowing of movement, and gait and balance problems. So even way back in 1817, James Parkinson noticed this just in people walking around the streets of London. And he described in his essays uh, the, the, these, these clinical features, focusing almost exclusively on the motor symptoms. So even from the beginning, this was described as a motor disorder, a disease of movement. He does allude a little bit uh, in one of his cases, which he followed over time, to the non-motor symptoms. And he wrote something like, in the end stages, sleep is disturbed, and there is a feebling of the mind such that acquaintances and colleagues do not recognize him. So even back then, there was a, a little tip of the hat to some of these non-motor features that uh, Parkinson recognized in, in the, this particular patient. But by and large, the description was, was all about the motor symptoms. However, um, we are now recognizing these non-motor features of the disease. This, the Parkinson's disease is much more than a movement problem. Uh, these, this pie chart represents some of the major um, areas that can be affected. And you can see that motor is the one that we primarily talk about, and that's the way that the disease is diagnosed. But we also have cognitive symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms, and by that I mean things like mood, uh, sleep, and autonomic symptoms. And by that, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about those. Those fall into a particular category. But you can see from the chart to the right that these are very common symptoms. So the, although the motor disorder is very prominent in the way that we diagnose the disease, these other features are also very, very common in, in the disease, with greater than 50% of people suffering from some of these features, and, and many from multiple of these features, with some of these being very, very common. For example, olfactory dysfunction, meaning loss of sense of smell, occurring in, in the vast majority of, of patients 
of sufferers. So these are, these are problems that affect lots of patients with Parkinson's disease. So it's something that we really do need to take uh, and pay attention to. So I, I think the best way to understand these features is to understand a little bit about the biology behind them. Uh, so if you'll bear with me for just a moment, um, I'm going to take you back to grade 10 biology, and we're going to talk about how the brain is organized, because I think that that's going to help you understand how these non-motor features come about and why, how we're treating them. So back to grade 10 biology, uh, you remember, of course, that the neurons are the cells that make up primarily your brain. They do most of the heavy lifting. They communicate using chemicals and electrical impulses. And the chemicals are called neurotransmitters primarily, neurotransmitters. So these are chemicals that the neurons use to communicate with each other. These neurons are connected to each other in large networks across the brain. And by communicating with each other in these large networks, they're able to provide all of the different things that we can do as humans. Everything from smelling things and recognizing an odor, to reaching and grabbing a cup of coffee, to thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, to recognize the face of a loved one, to planning, to abstract thought, to thinking about religion, spirituality, anything that you, anything that you can do is a product of these large networks in the brain that consist of neurons talking to each other. So communication between neurons in these large networks is critical to everything that we do. Different parts of the brain are responsible for different behaviors. So movement, for example, occurs primarily using neurons in this area of the brain called the motor cortex. So when you decide to reach out and grab a cup of coffee, neurons and networks here are activated, and they're the things that, that allow you to do that. But other areas of the brain do different things, like memory and facial recognition and all sorts of different things, and these are all over the brain. So why is that important? Well, here's how the disruption of those networks causes problems, both in motor function, but also in your thinking abilities as well. So I'm going to walk you through this slide. It's, it's very detailed. This is the slide that I use for my medical students, but it's, it's fairly simple in its premise. And, and what I want to show you here is down at this, this slide here, this is a DAT scan, and this tells you the presence of dopamine transporters in the brain. So dopamine is one of the critical chemicals that um, is reduced in Parkinson's disease. How many of you know Cinemet? L-DOPA, okay, so I see more hands here. So this is a drug that basically is the precursor of dopamine because the cells that produce dopamine in the brain die off for an unknown reason. We don't know why, but they die off. They're critical for making dopamine. And you can see in this DAT scan here, somebody with PD or Parkinson's disease has less of these hot spots in the brain than a control brain. You can see that there's a lot more red here because this control brain or somebody without Parkinson's disease is making a lot of dopamine. And so the neurons that use dopamine have access to it. In Parkinson's disease, there's less dopamine. So the neurons that need that dopamine don't have access to it. That's important because dopamine is critical for allowing all of the networks in the brain or many networks in the brain to work. And not just motor networks, but also non-motor networks. And not only dopamine here, but also other chemicals called acetylcholine, serotonin, and then several others as well. And the important thing is that these chemicals that are made in the base of the brain project or get used all over the cortex of the brain. And if you remember from the previous slide, these networks are distributed all over the brain. So if you're losing these chemicals, the areas of the brain that do important things cannot work. And it's not just motor function, it's all cognitive functions, or, or many of them. So I also want to bring up this, this uh, newly recognized idea of a preclinical phase of Parkinson's disease in which the symptoms, usually non-motor symptoms, almost exclusively, occur before the motor symptoms. And if we can recognize this constellation of non-motor symptoms, we might get a cue that somebody's about to develop Parkinson's disease. And these are increasingly recognized as this preclinical phase of Parkinson's disease, and it's characterized by a loss of sense of smell, 
REM behavior disorder, which I'll describe in a little bit, but that's a problem with sleep and acting out in your sleep. Uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, mood disorders, particularly depression, and constipation, so a lack of motility in the gut. So these non-motor symptoms, so this occurs well before, perhaps years or decades before the first onset of tremor or stiffness or falls or any other of the motor symptoms. So these non-motor symptoms actually occur before motor symptoms. And if you look at the evolution of these non-motor symptoms, um, you can see that, that this is what we're learning. If you think about age or time down here and uh, function here, which high is good, um, you've got dopaminergic neurons. This is the number of neurons that I showed you on that DAT scan. So you've got a 100% here in time. They start to fall off in individuals with Parkinson's disease such that the time of diagnosis or the first time that somebody notices that shake in their hand, there's about 50 to 60 to even perhaps 70% of the dopamines have already died off and are no longer producing dopamine. So the, what we're trying to do is trying to identify people in this phase of the disease before they show up at the neurologist for the very first time with a, a shaking hand. And because here we have a chance to save the neurons, hopefully, if we develop therapies to do so. By the time they get to the neurologist, the horse is already out of the barn. About 70% of the neurons have already been lost. And so it makes it much more difficult to treat somebody when the neurons aren't there anymore. They're not producing the, the, the dopamine. So this is the, the importance of this preclinical phase, is that we want to identify individuals before neurons are lost and that dopamine goes away, because then we can hopefully treat it. But you can see that the, the motor symptoms is in the red line here, and you can see that that occurs and, and gets worse over time right after the onset, or maybe just a little bit before you show up at the doctor. But these non-motor symptoms, the green line, show up way before. And so these non-motor symptoms are very important for us to look for in people because they might tell us that they're developing Parkinson's disease. What, are, what is the impact of these non-motor symptoms? They're very common, as I told you earlier, affecting a majority of patients, some up to 90%. Um, they're typically less predominant or more subtle in the early phases of the disease, but they do increase in severity with disease duration. These non-motor symptoms critically impact your quality of life. And if you listen to most patients, they'll tell you the things that are most troubling to them are not necessarily the tremor, although that, that can be very bothersome, or the falls, but it's the depression, the lack of motivation, hallucinations, dementia. These are the things that bother people the most, and these are the things, if you understand, hallucinations and dementia are the two greatest risk factors for placement in nursing homes. Those are two non-motor symptoms that um, bother the patients and are difficult for the care partners to, to, to manage that precipitate placement into nursing homes. So these are non-motor symptoms typically that precipitate movement into um, uh, movement away from independent living. So these are very important. I'd like to go through that pie chart, if you can remember that in your mind's eye, uh, and go through the different uh, pieces of the pie. We're going to uh, exclude motor symptoms for now because you're going to hear about that later in the day. But I'm going to go through uh, the different pieces of the pie, and we're going to start with the autonomic symptoms. Autonomic symptoms involve the autonomic nervous system, and this is the basic part of your nervous system that does things that are sort of automatic. You don't have to think about these things. Um, they, these autonomic symptoms can occur early in the disease, and it's not always related to severity. I mean, they can be very bad early, even when the non-motor, sorry, the motor symptoms are, are not so bad. They consist of primarily uh, urogenitary uh, uh, problems, particularly bladder problems would be the, the most common, and this consists of urinary frequency, urgency, uh, and, and frank incontinence at times. Um, this can be a very significant predictor of quality of life. Again, this is bothersome to patients um, if you're having trouble with uh, urinary problems. There's also problems with swallowing. This is called dysphagia. And this happens in a, in a large uh, proportion of patients. And it's a really a significant concern because obviously the concern here is choking. Um, and, and caregiver, care partners are very concerned about this. 
Um, excessive sweating can occur. This is an autonomic feature, particularly in the hands and feet. And this is unrelated to exercise. So this is when you're not exercising, you have excessive sweating in your hands and feet. Um, and this can be a problem, and this can be embarrassing, and it can cause problems with sleep as well. Orthostatic hypotension is a word for low blood pressure upon standing. So you're sitting down or you're lying down, you stand up quickly, and suddenly your blood pressure drops and you become faint and, and uh, woozy. Uh, this can be reported as transient giddiness or lightheadedness by patients. And they don't typically pass out um, because of this, but the risk is really for falls here. Um, it, it can make you faint um, and, and go down momentarily, uh, but you don't necessarily pass out. Sleep disturbances are a big uh, impactor on quality of life. Sleep is very important to us. We all know what we feel like the next day when we don't get good sleep. Uh, sleep disturbance occurs frequently in Parkinson's disease, uh, greater than 50%. Uh, and, and the most common problems are REM behavior disorder and restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is that twitchy feeling, the feeling like you've got spiders crawling up your legs. Um, if, you, if you've felt it, you know what it is. Um, and you feel like your legs are always jiggling around and moving. Uh, it's it's fair, fairly common in Parkinson's disease. The other is REM behavior disorder. This is acting out during sleep. Your brain, uh, from evolutionary standpoint, uh, decided it was a good thing to turn its motor functions off during sleep so that you don't act out your dreams. If you did, that would be a big, big problem. Well, in Parkinson's disease and some other disorders, that part of the brain isn't working very well, and your brain can become active, and it doesn't shut itself down. And so you can start to act out in your dreams. And we've all probably done this once or twice across our lives. But in, in Parkinson's disease, the problem is much more significant. People will get up and actually walk around the house uh, acting out dreams. They might strike a, a bed partner. Um, they might uh, beat up a bit, uh, in their sleep. Uh, so this is a very troubling uh, symptom. So this is something to be aware of. Again, this is one of the things that happen early in this preclinical stage that I told you about, the premotor stage of Parkinson's disease. If you're noticing REM behavior disorder, um, that might be uh, an indication that, that Parkinson's disease might be uh, on its way. Excessive daytime sleepiness happens in, in about 15 to 50% of patients. This is feeling sleepy during the day, falling asleep frequently, despite trying your best to stay awake. And then uh, the other side of the coin is insomnia, people having trouble falling asleep. And again, this is highly prevalent, and uh, there are many factors that contribute to this, including restless legs. It's hard to fall asleep if your legs are jumping around. Uh, so th this is uh, sleep problems can be very disturbing. Now to the neuropsychiatric symptoms. I, I told you this is about mood, primarily. Um, and the most common neuro neuropsychiatric symptom is depression. Depression is common, occurs in uh, over half of, of patients with Parkinson's disease. Again, the uh, definition of depression is feelings of sadness or uh, feeling down or blue lasting greater than two weeks. That's the official definition of of depression, and it can cause changes in associated with uh, changes in sleep and appetite, uh, decreased concentration, uh, thinking problems, uh, increased fatigue, feeling slowed down, feeling like they can't get the energy, and even feelings of worthlessness or guilt, or feelings of uh, suicide or a wish for death. Um, and, and this is a common feature of, of depression. It is uh, more predictive of distress, again, than motor disability. So again, I, I, I hope you're hearing a recurrent theme is that these non-motor symptoms are more problematic to the patient, typically, than the motor symptoms. Um, and, and, and depression itself is more common in men with Parkinson's disease, particularly if they've had depression before or they have a family history of it. The cause of depression is probably multifactorial. There are psychological factors that affect your mood, of course. Um, coping with a life-changing illness like Parkinson's disease can cause you to become depressed. Um, early retirement may cause you to become depressed. Changes in routine activities and things that you do that usually make you happy that you can no longer do could make you depressed. But there's also biological problems as well. Now, we talked about those neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, uh, acetylcholine, Turns out those are all very important for regulating your mood as well. And if you're losing those chemicals in your brain, 
you might have problems with your mood. So there's, it's probably this depression to, with Parkinson's disease is probably caused by both biological problems and psychological or psychosocial factors. It's a challenge sometimes to recognize if somebody's depressed because with Parkinson's disease, you have motor features that cause a slowing or a decrease in spontaneous movement that are unrelated to depression. But it makes you look like you're depressed. And so people around you might say, geez, you look depressed, but it's really just the Parkinson's disease giving you a masked face. You don't show facial expression. Or you sit in your chair and you don't move much. And that leads people around you to say, you've got to be depressed because you're just, you don't seem spontaneously moving around. But it's really the Parkinson's disease. So really, here, um, the, the, the report of the patient is critical to determine whether they're depressed or not. And there's a problem there because some people don't have very good insight into how they feel their moods. And some people are reluctant to report uh, feeling down. Um, and, and that's more common in men than women. The other neuro major neuropsychiatric symptom is anxiety. And these are feelings of tension or worry that last several months, up to six months or more. These, again, are feeling, uh, feelings that are bothersome to the patient. They feel out of control. Uh, it can produce decreased concentration or attention, feeling overwhelmed. Um, there's irritability and, again, poor sleep. And I think I'm, you're seeing sleep come up again and again. It's not only a symptom of Parkinson's disease. It's also a symptom of anxiety or depression um, and these other things. So there's this whole constellation of symptoms. And that constellation of symptoms occurs because the same chemicals are being affected in the brain. And that's why I wanted to tell you a little bit about the biology. Anxiety can be experienced as generalized anxiety. You're always feeling on edge about everything all the time. Anxiety attacks, which are periodic moments of anxiety where you get in a situation, you've just become immediately anxious. Obsessive compulsive disorder, which is characterized by routine uh, behaviors that you can't stop, and social avoidance. Again, the, the causes are multifactorial likely, both psychologically, um, you, may have, you might be anxious because you actually are worried about falling because it's a real risk and that would be a bad thing. So that's not anxiety, that's a real reaction and that's normal, it should be. Um, it, but it also could be biological as well, uh, these neurochemical factors that I spoke to you about earlier. The challenges really are that um, you know, some of these things might be realistic uh, worries that the patient will have and should have. Uh, they should not put themselves into risky situations if they're afraid they're going to fall. That's not anxiety, that's, that's good judgment. Um, and some of the motor symptoms also can be mistaken for anxiety. If you've got a, a tremor that affects your axial uh, in an axial tremor, meaning your body shakes, it might look like you're nervous and you're anxious, but it's not anxiety, it's a part of the motor symptoms. The other neuropsychiatric disorder I wanna talk about is impulse control or ICD, impulse control disorders. Um, these are difficulty uh, controlling impulses. We all have natural impulses as a part of our biology. It's just a, a, a fact of who we are. But we've evolved to have brain structures that tamp those impulses down. So we all want to do things, but the, our brains tell us, no, that's not a good idea to do that now. You see this often, for example, in, in children where their brains haven't developed that area very well yet, the, the one that tamps things down, and they'll act impulsively. They'll grab the cookie when they know they're not supposed to, or they'll steal the toy from a, a playmate um, but in adults, we know that these are not things that we should do, even though we have the same impulses. We want that toy or we want that new Ferrari, but we're not going to go and steal it because we know that's not the thing to do. So we all have impulses, but in Parkinson's disease and in other impulse control disorders, those areas of the brain that tamp those down and tell us we really shouldn't be doing, acting on those impulses are, are, are liberated. And suddenly the impulses can rise and, and the person actually acts on the impulse. These can take the form of things like binge eating, um, hypersexuality, compulsive behaviors like compulsive gambling, just generally acting without thinking. Um, these are commonly seen not in de novo Parkinson's disease, meaning not in just frank Parkinson's, but they're usually a side effect of treatments. So sometimes the drugs that are used in Parkinson's disease or sometimes deep brain stimulation or other surgical therapies can cause these areas of the brain to stop working and impulses can come to the forefront. 
So these are most commonly seen as what we call iatrogenic effects, meaning side effects of treatment that are unwanted. Uh, these can be uh, impactful as well. Clearly, if you're having some of these problems, they can impact your family and care partners and can damage uh, relationships. Uh, people drain their 401ks or their, their bank accounts or their pensions um, and spending things and doing things that they shouldn't. Uh, so these, these are really significant problems. They can be. I want to talk about a neuropsychiatric feature uh, just briefly here, hallucinations. Um, and again, these are commonly seen primarily as a side effect of medications. Um, but a hallucination uh, in Parkinson's disease is usually a visual hallucination, that is seeing things that aren't there, that aren't real, that other people don't see. In Parkinson's disease, the hallucinations visual are usually non-threatening. These are things that they see that, that don't bother them necessarily. They can be um, uh, formed, meaning looking like people or animals or children, or they can be non-formed. They can be blurs or shapes and wiggly things or colors, um, but they tend to be non-threatening. Um, they, they aren't monsters that come and, and chase them or things like that, typically. Uh, they can be uh, present in, in stress-related situations, and they're, they're usually there for a little bit and then go away. They don't stay for long. Um, but it's important that if you or your, or your person with Parkinson's disease is experiencing these to tell your doctor about them because they're most commonly seen as side effects of the medications or treatments. And so your doctor can do something about that, uh, particularly if they become, um, if they're reacting to the hallucinations, if they're trying to get away from something, or if it's bothersome to the patient, if they're seeing people who have passed on, for example, and it's bothersome to the person, that's probably something that you want to talk to your doctor about because it's not something they want to see. Okay, now to cognitive symptoms. This was the other piece of the pie, and this is the area that I specialize in uh, as a neuropsychologist. Cognitive changes are, are very common in Parkinson's disease, uh, greater than 70%, but certainly greater than 50% experience some form of cognitive changes. I want to point out that dementia, although you saw in that previous graph, uh, sorry, table, up to 90% um, of patients experience dementia. I, I think that's an overestimate. In, in my practice, I think that it's, it's, it's lower than that. I, I would say probably between 25, 30, maybe a third of patients um, experience dementia, frank dementia. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about dementia um, in a bit here, but I wanna point out that the cognitive changes of Parkinson's disease are of a particular kind. And again, going back to the biology that we learned about earlier, the cognitive changes of Parkinson's disease are due to a slowing of information transfer in the brain. So those neurons and those large networks of neurons that talk to each other do talk to each other, but the information that they pass around goes around a lot slower in Parkinson's disease because of the lack of this chemical, particularly dopamine, serotonin, and acetylcholine. So the problem is not a loss of information typically, it's just slower in getting there. Think of the cognitive problems of Parkinson's disease just like you would the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. An overall slowing in difficulty regulating the motor output and the cognitive output. If you think of it that way, um, the cognitive symptoms don't become perhaps, um, perhaps as scary. And, I, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. So the most common cognitive symptoms are memory loss, and it's a particular kind of memory loss. Again, it's the slowness of retrieval, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then word finding, coming up with the right word when you want it, as you need it. Again, it's there, but it just takes you some time to get it. I'm gonna go through the cognitive domains really briefly now. Uh, they are attention and processing speed, executive dysfunction, language, memory, and visual perception. That's what all of these areas of the brain, different areas of the brain do these different things and the way that they're affected in an individual is going to give you the, the, the symptoms of that individual. So attention and processing speed. This is the primary problem in Parkinson's disease. It's a slowing of information transfer between those neurons. And the main problem is, a, is something called bradyphrenia, which is exactly the analog to bradykinesia. Bradyphrenia is a slowing of thinking. Bradykinesia is a slowing of movement. So again, if you think of the cognitive symptoms being really just the same mechanistically as the motor symptoms, things are just slowed down um, and, and you're having difficulty regulating them. So there's a delay in responding to verbal questions. Uh, it just takes a little extra time for the person to process. 
Uh, it takes longer to complete tasks, not because they're slow in moving, but their brain just takes some time to process what's going on and how, what, what the next step is. Again, this can be dis uh, mistaken for depression. So people might think you're depressed because you don't respond immediately. But it's not depression, it's, it's the slowness of thinking. Executive function, um, I'm gonna run through this. I have about 10 minutes left. And then we're gonna take some questions. I think uh, we, we might have some time for a couple of questions. So let me uh, step through this rather quickly then. Executive function uh, problems, planning, uh, completing multi-step tasks. For example, if you've gotta do a recipe from, uh, from that's not written down that you know by heart, it might take you a little longer and it might take uh, some extra effort in order to get those steps in line. Um, this may, executive function problems may show you show up as difficulty initiating new tasks or behavior, and it might show it up as impaired judgment or impulse control. Language, um, the major problem here is something called tip of the tongue phenomena. This is when you have a word in mind, you know exactly what it is, you know you want what you want to say, but it just doesn't come. For those of us with um, poor vocabularies, uh, that might show up as a real problem because you can't find a good substitute for the word that you want to come up with at that moment. The issue is, is, is remember, the problem is that you haven't, you haven't lost the word. It's not like you've forgotten the word. It's that you just can't bring it up in a rapid way. Again, it's the slowing of information transfer. And visual perception can lead, uh, these problems lead to poor problems with depth perception and navigation. This can affect driving. And I want to go to memory because this is a common complaint, but I want to point out that memory is not a thing. Memory is a series of steps. In order to remember something, you have to encode the information first, meaning you have to pay attention to it. If you don't pay attention to something, you're not going to remember it. The next thing you have to do is you have to put it together and store it. You got to put it someplace and store it. And then you got to be able to retrieve it when you want it. Those three steps are memory. The trouble with Parkinson's disease is that they have problems encoding information and retrieving information rapidly. They don't have problems storing information. In Alzheimer's disease, the opposite is true. They can encode fairly well, and they can retrieve when they have it. But the problem is here in Alzheimer's disease. Their storage system just goes away. They don't have any storage. They, they've run out of storage. They go to put it into the, into the uh, file cabinet, and there's no room. Or they put it in, and it, somebody takes it, and it's just not there. That's different from Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, the information is there. They're just having trouble retrieving it in a timely way when they need it. So given some time, they can come up with it, usually. And here, uh, dementia. Um, dementia is more severe cognitive changes than what I've just described. Um, they do affect uh, probably a quarter to a third, maybe up to 50% in some studies. Uh, but the important thing is not everybody with Parkinson's disease uh, develops a dementia. It usually occurs much later in the course of the disease. It's not an early feature. So I want to just end up the, the session with just a couple of slides on what we can do for brain fitness. I've given you all of this information about what can go wrong. Now I'm, I want to tell you a couple of things about, well, what can we do to keep, keep our brains healthy? And there are all of these things. I, I think you may have um, in your take-home points uh, a list of some of these things. But I'm going to focus on this last one here, mental activity. Keeping our brains healthy is a function of how much we use them. The more that we use our brain and keep them engaged, the more that we can keep them healthy. In addition to, these, to those other things here, uh, using the proper medications, reducing stress, physical exercise, um, and other lifestyle choices and diet. But mental activity is important because it accelerates the rate that those new brain cells grow and talk to each other. When you're doing mental activities, there are three key principles for a good brain exercise. It has to be something new. You have to switch it up, and you have to challenge yourself. So those are the three key principles of a good brain activity. What are some examples? Really anything can be strengthening for your brain that engages your brain. When you engage your brain, you encourage neurons to do new things and talk to new neighbors, and it creates new synapses. So anything that you find challenging, novel, and, and, and different on a day-to-day -day basis can be good for your brain. 
And uh, here's a list of the things here that you can see. It can be anything as, as simple as going to museums and uh, attending workshops and et cetera, card games, those sorts of things, anything like that. Try to learn something new every day if you can. It's important to challenge yourself every day. Um, and here are some tips. It's important to um, practice remembering. The more you call up a memory, the stronger that memory becomes. That's why we can all remember the street address of the first house we lived in, because we've thought about it so many times, but we can't remember what we did yesterday. We have, just haven't had time to practice those memories. Reduce distractions when you're trying to remember things. That allows us to encode information more permanently. And then there are different ways. I'm going to tell you about attend, visualize, and connect. Pay, actively pay attention to what you want to remember. Create a vivid visual image of what you want to remember, and then connect the images. If you want to remember that you parked your car in space 3B, you might say 3B, that reminds me of three angry bees. If you create an image as crazy as possible, it's going to help you remember where your car is parked. Um, and it sounds crazy, but if you try it, it actually does work. Commit yourself to remembering names. This is a common problem. Um, and I'll, I'll step through these. Are they going to have access to the slides? Yes, yes. OK. So you, you'll get these slides. These are really just lists of things that, that you can do to, to prompt and to cue. Um, so the take home points are, are listed uh, in the sheet that you have as well. We do have time for questions. So okay. thank you very much. That was You're a wonderful okay. educator. Oh. Yeah, my name is Dean Tweedle. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I can articulate this uh, too well, but there's a, a, uh, a necessity to, for early diagnosis of Parkinson's. And I'm wondering why it's so important to diagnose earlier so that you can do what? Give medication sooner? Uh, solve the problem? <laughs> Yeah. What, what's, what's the importance of early diagnosis? Why? Okay, so, so the question is about early diagnosis and, and why we're so interested in that. And I, I tried to summarize it in, in the one plot where I showed the dopamine neurons falling off. And by the time a patient shows up to the clinic and says, my hand is shaking, about 70% of those dopamine producing neurons have already died off. They cannot be saved anymore. And so the only thing that we can do is provide therapies or medicines or other approaches to help the remaining 30% do the work of those 70 that have died off. So what we want to do is catch people when there's 20% have died off or 0% have died off so that we can preserve those functions and those neurons. What we want to do is have disease modifying therapies that are actually going to save the neurons. We don't know how to do that yet. And so the question right now is what about people today and people, you know, five years from now, why do they need to know? Because there's no therapy yet, really, that we know of. It's important to enroll those people into clinical trials, into research studies, in order to develop the therapies that will become effective to help future sufferers of Parkinson's disease. And the only way that we can do that is to, is to actually have people where there's the, the neurons are dying, but there's enough left that we can try to save and then test new drugs. So this is a long process. It's not like we, you know, if we can only identify those people, we've cured them. That's not the, that's the hope, but we're not there yet. First, we have to develop therapies, and, and we can only do that by identifying people in the preclinical phase. Just follow up with that. So how do you, does Cinemat or do the, med, do the medications actually help in saving the neurons the that, answer, that are left? The short answer is no. Essentially what the Cinemet does is it provides the, the precursor of dopamine so that 30% can do what those 70% used to do. So the 70% used to make dopamine, but now it can't. So they're gonna, we're gonna give the 30% a little extra so that it can make more dopamine. So the Cinemet is not neuroprotective. It's not necessarily protecting those neurons from dying. The fact is that the neurons continue to die and we, we can't stop them. There is no disease reversing therapies yet. Although people are working on this. Um, I would like to know if the non-motor symptoms occur um, earlier than the motor symptoms in early onset Parkinson's. So the, the question is if, if the non-motor symptoms occur earlier than the motor symptoms. Yes. 
Um, yes, yes, they do. So, so this, this preclinical or premotor syndrome that I described of loss of sense of smell, difficulty with constipation or gut motility, um, REM behavior disorder, these are non-motor. They, they don't have, uh, in necessarily involve tremor or rigidity. Uh, those occur in the premotor phase before the motor symptoms occur. Oh, in, oh, in young onset. Oh, I see. Uh, so, so, so young onset Parkinson's, of course, is, is onset in the, in the 40s or 50s. Um, we're not sure about that. Actually, that's a very good question. So we don't know if that occurs in the early, um, young onset Parkinson's disease as well. We suspect that it does, but probably that time frame is compacted so that the onset of the non-motor happens really quickly and then the motor just comes on board immediately. One of, one of my biggest, biggest challenges is the loss of ability on facial recognition. I'm wondering if there's any exercises that you could recommend that would change that or improve my ability to recognize faces? Uh, I wish there was an easy answer to that. Um, there's probably not. So what you can do is you can um, embellish your memory. So we have two memory systems in our, actually we have many memory systems in our brain. And when you have a, a problem with visual memory, it's most helpful to involve the other types of memory systems to help you with that memory. So if you've got difficulty recognizing a face, you can use your verbal memory as well. And so what you need to do is pair the face with something verbal. You could maybe describe it. You could have somebody else describe it to you in words. And then pairing that what you see in front of you, the face, with the words can make that memory stronger. Eventually, uh, typical problems with, with, with facial memory extend also to other spatial memory as well. Um, and again, the, the issue here is, is, to, is to pair your other memory systems with uh, the visual memory. So that, that would be my suggestion, but it's a difficult problem to, to work with. Morning, doctor. Thanks for your thanks for your presentation. As I said, whenever I speak, everybody say they don't understand. They don't understand what I said. But whatever in your presentation, all the points you had, uh, I got it. I had 26 years of Parkinson's disease after I diagnosed. But I want to ask you one thing, is that uh, the, the noise, they were the hearing some noise. Sim, is that a symptom for Parkinson's? Parkinson? He, hearing noise is a yeah. symptom of Parkinson's? I have fire, fire alarm being heard a mm -hmm. couple of times. And that scared me a lot. Yeah. And I, I ring the bell and, uh, and, uh, and the worker said that there's no, no fire alarm. It's been two times, uh, two times that happened. Uh, and Dr. Howard would say that it must be I have overdose of cinema, overdose of do dopamine. Do you know that word? Is that a symptom such as is it included in the hallucination or is it an, another symptom? I, I, it sounds to me like an auditory hallucination. If it sounds like a fire alarm to you and it's very distinctive, it could also be something like tinnitus, which is a ringing of the ears can take a shape or form or sound like bells. But it sounds more like an auditory hallucination to me. Um, and that's, I'm sorry that it's frightening for you. Uh, that must be scary. And um, it's something that you should probably talk to your doctor about because it, there might be a, um, a way to address that so that it's not happening as much. Do you think that it's important for the children of people with Parkinson's to get tested? Tested for what? For Parkinson's for disease. For Parkinson's. Uh, well, so the genetics of Parkinson's disease um, we're learning more and more about. And so your risk for Parkinson's disease, if you have a parent with Parkinson's disease, is a little bit higher. It's not much higher. There are genetic forms of Parkinson's disease due to gene mutations, meaning if your parent had it, you will get it, or you have a 50-50 chance of getting it, and if you have the gene mutation, you will get the disease. Those are very rare, quite rare. So the likelihood of inheriting one of those genes is real, but it's, it's really very small. I mean, on the order of 
in the United, I'm not sure what the, the figures are for Canada, but on the, in, in North America, sorry, in the United States, there's probably about 50 families in the United States that have, that are known to carry this gene mutation. And we pretty much know which families they are. So I, I would say if you have questions about it, um, to ask your, your parents, the, 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 the patient's doctor, if it's a good idea for you, and ask your doctor if it's, if it's reasonable. I would probably advise my patients not to get gene tested. Uh, what do you think the deep brain stimulation does with the chemicals in the brain there? Well, the, we don't exactly know why deep brain stimulation works, but what it's doing is it's, it's targeting with electricity certain areas of the brain that are part of the cycle to liberate dopamine. It doesn't target the areas that make dopamine, so it's not increasing the output of dopamine, but it is increasing the output of the whole network by turning off parts of the brain that act as brakes. So if you think of uh, dopamine as being the gas on a car, it makes you go. Well, it turns out that there's also some brakes at play as well, and what DBS does is it pulls off those brakes so that whatever gas you have works better. That's the, the current understanding of DBS right now when it's targeting the subthalamic nucleus. There are other targets that do different things, but these can also have effects on, on thinking um, be, and not just the motor symptom because, again, all of these networks are connected to each other. And the most common changes in thinking after DBS include things like impulse control behaviors and also trouble focusing and sustaining attention. Um, so that we, the, the short answer is we don't really know why DBS works. And even with all of the animal models we have, we, we don't know that yet. But it seems to work in some patients well. Thank you. You're awesome. Um, Thank you. So my dad has, my stepdad has um, Parkinson's. He's 86. It seemed to be such a, a difficult thing to get diagnosed earlier than later. And so I, I agree with the whole concept that why aren't, why isn't it more possible to be diagnosed even earlier as we learn more about Parkinson's? But the, is there a way to diagnose it? I mean, my, my, now my dad's neurologist says he's Parkinson's spectrum. He's not really Parkinson's. He's Lewy body dementia with the hallucinations, but he doesn't have a lot of the uh, movement disorder problems mm. significantly. And he had the REM and he had the early on, but they couldn't, they didn't diagnose it because nobody seems to really at a, at a GP level, they're all confused. So it, would it mean going to a neuropsychologist type your, uh, if that was the right, right um, title for yourself, or it, what is it? I, I think it's a, multi, it's a great question. It's a multifaceted problem. Um, I think here with the healthcare system in Canada, there's a, a lack of providers um, that, that had this specialized knowledge, which we have more of in the States, and we heard about that earlier. Um, also, th this notion of premotor Parkinson's disease is relatively new. And so this doesn't always filter down the way that it should. And so your GP probably may not know this. And she may think that this is just part of normal aging when really that constellation of symptoms is very specific. If you have REM behavior disorder, loss of sense of smell, and constipation, you know, that's, that's a pretty powerful triad. So I, I think it's multifactorial. I think it's access to care. It's the knowledge filtering down. And the fact that it's really just relatively new. I, I think going to a specialist is really the best way that you're going to get this uh, diagnosed earlier. And the last thing I would add to that is that we're actively, aggressively trying to develop blood biomarkers of preclinical or premotor Parkinson's disease in which we can find something in the blood we're trying hard that we could just do a simple blood test and say, we don't even need to see the REM behavior disorder and loss of sense of smell. We can catch this even before those show up that would be the optimal. And so that's kind of the holy grail that everybody is, is shooting for now, because if we can do that, then we can enroll those people into trials, develop medicines that preserve their neurons, and that would be a prevention rather than treatment. So that, that's kind of where the field is going. Lots of money, lots of work. I mean, there's a lot that needs to get done.
More questions. Ooh, sorry, that cut out. Two more questions. Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, you, uh, in, the, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, there are uh, all the non-motor symptoms and uh, a few of the motor symptoms you said may have come, like the, the onset is a bit later. I was just wondering if there's a group of or, or a set of symptoms that have an earlier onset compared to the other non-motor symptoms. So a, a group of non-motor symptoms that come before other non-motor yeah, symptoms? Yeah, like the, the, the progression, because you mentioned there are um, some, some non-motor symptoms that, came, that come most uh, possibly as a result of, as a, of a side, uh, side effects of drugs, so those would come later, right? Would there be mm -hmm. some that come earlier than others? Those maybe would be more useful to watch out for? Yeah, so the most common ones are, are part of this premotor profile that I described. The loss of sense of smell is usually the earliest. Sleep disorders, which typically is REM behavior disorder, but also restless leg syndrome. Um, constipation, so problems with gut motility. And then also uh, depression can be an early symptom as well. So those, those four sort of pull together that premotor uh, set of symptoms that come before others like hallucinations or memory loss or dementia. Those tend to come later in the course of the disease. Impulse control disorders tend to be the side effect of medications. So you're not probably going to see them until you start treating with a medication that causes it. So that would sort of be the timeline of how some of these would evolve. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I've heard a lot of these things before, but I feel I understand them a little bit better now. Good. Uh, you touched on blood markers just a little bit when you were answering the question before the last one. Can you tell us anything else about that? Because that seems to be one of your areas of research, and um, I would be interested to hear it. Sure, thank you for the uh, softball. Um, so, <laughs> I. My research in the laboratory is, is to develop blood biomarkers of neurodegenerative diseases, of which Parkinson's is one, and Alzheimer's is another, and Huntington's disease is another. Um, and what we're trying to do is look at the, the uh, pathophysiology of these diseases. That is, what is it in the biology that causes these cells to die? We don't know that yet in all of these diseases. And a major player in all of this is something called oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is a mechanism by which your body, when it needs energy really quickly, let's say to do a, a quick uh, mental calculation or to get up real quickly from a chair, it uses energy and, and creates energy, the cells do, very quickly. When it uses and creates energy in that rapid fashion, it creates byproducts that are harmful, and these are free radicals. And your body has to get rid of those free radicals because they're bad. They're free radicals. They're bad things. So a reduction in the ability to get rid of those free radicals is called oxidative stress. And we think that this is a, a primary feature of what's causing the neurons in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease to die. So we're trying to develop blood biomarkers of oxidative stress, among other things, in order to determine if that oxidative stress is going on in, in people before they get the disease. So that, that's essentially what, what my work, and, and others, there are many others around the world that are smarter than I am that are doing this too. So um, lots of us are working. So, so thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Mastone. That was fabulous. You're welcome. <laughs>